On 7th July 1956, the government of Sri Lanka under the 4th Prime Minister SWRD Badranaike passed an act called Singhala Only Act. This act made Singhala as a sole official language of Sri Lanka, replacing English and Tamil. Singhala, also known as Singhalese, was the language of Ceylon's majority Singhalese people, who accounted for around 70% of the country's population. So what's wrong with the act? Since Sri Lanka was a former British colony, English was the official language of the state for a very long time. The Tamils, who constitute the biggest minority group of Sri Lanka, mastered the English language and hence secured high government posts. The Singhalese began to envy the Tamils for the high posts that they held. After this act was passed, many Tamil-speaking civil servants were forced to resign because they weren't fluent in Singhala. In the 1970s, the government of Sri Lanka introduced the policy of standardization, according to which the Tamil students must secure more marks compared to their Singhalese counterpart to gain admission into Sri Lankan universities. It was only a matter of time, riots broke out between the majority Singhalese and the minority Tamils. Major riots took place in 1956, 1958, 1977, 1981 and 1983, in which thousands of Tamils lost their lives. On the 1st of June 1981, a bunch of police and government-sponsored paramilitaries reached the Jaffna Public Library. The Jaffna Public Library contained over 97,000 books, including ancient books written on palm leaves. This library was seen as a repository of the culture and the history of the Tamil people. The Sri Lankan mob set it on fire and burned down the entire library. This incident sowed the seeds of a full-fledged civil war in Sri Lanka. Little did the Singhalese know that their beautiful country was going to be turned into a deadly war zone. The persecution of the Tamils evoked strong protest across Tamil Nadu, the southern state of India. India, a regional superpower, wanted to be actively involved in the conflict. The Indian government, headed by Indira Gandhi, had a deep suspicion on the pro-Western Sri Lankan president, J.R. Jayavadane. Mr. Jayavadane introduced a new constitution and a liberal open economy. Sri Lanka's adoption of liberal open economy system was a big disappointment to the socialist India. Also in the 1971 Indo-Pak War, Sri Lanka allowed Pakistani ships to be fueled in its ports. Hence from 1983, the Indian intelligence agency RAW began training various Tamil insurgent groups. The first batch of Tigers were trained in Establishment 22 based in Chakrata, Uttarakhand. In the second batch, LTT intelligence chief Puttu Amman and its leader Velupule Prabhakaran were trained in Himachal Pradesh. Eight other batches of LTT were trained in Tamil Nadu. Approximately 495 LTT insurgents, including 90 women, were trained in 32 camps by RAW in India. These well-trained insurgents, who later returned to Sri Lanka, would go on to launch a deadly civil war in pursuit of a new homeland for the Tamils, called the Tamil Elam. Initially, there were many insurgent groups, but the LTT headed by Velupule Prabhagaran eliminated all other groups and became the single representative of the Tamils in Sri Lanka. On July 23, 1983, in Tirunelveli, Jaffna, the LTT carried out their first offensive by detonating a roadside bomb on a jeep that was leading the Sri Lankan patrol convoy. Soldiers traveling in the truck behind the jeep then dismounted to help their fellow soldiers. The LTT fired at them with automatic weapons and hurled grenades. In the ensuing clash, one officer and 12 soldiers were killed. This incident is considered the beginning of the Sri Lankan civil war. Following this incident, there were riots all across Sri Lanka. Some 3,000 Tamil civilians lost their lives. With advanced weapons and communications, the LTT launched multiple attacks on the Sri Lankan army. Slowly but steadily, the LTT took control of the Jaffna Peninsula and other Tamil-dominated regions. On 26 May 1987, the Sri Lankan army launched a major offensive called Operation Vadamarachi or Liberation. The operation involved nearly 4,000 troops supported by ground attack aircrafts, helicopter gunships and naval gunboats. The first nine days of the mission went very well with the army recapturing a lot of land area in the Jaffna Peninsula. The LTT was pinned down to the city of Jaffna and its surroundings. To prevent any escape, the Sri Lankan Navy blockaded the entire Jaffna Peninsula. The LTT, now surrounded by the Sri Lankan forces and trapped, appealed to India for help. 
On 4th of June 1987, the Indian Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi requested the Sri Lankan government to stop all offensive action on LTT and Jaffna. This was seen by the Sri Lankan government as India interfering with its internal affairs. Rajiv then ordered a flotilla of 19 fishing boats carrying 38 tons of food, fuel and medicine escorted by the Indian Coast Guard to be sent to Jaffna. The Sri Lankan Navy intercepted the convoy and threatened to fire at them if they did not leave. After four hours of standoff, the convoy headed back to India. When the naval mission failed, the Indian military launched Operation Pumalai. In this mission, five AN-32s accompanied by five Mirage 2000s of the No. 7 Squadron left Bangalore loaded with food and medicines towards Sri Lanka. India warned Sri Lanka if it tried to stop the mission, it would be met with force by the escorting Mirage 2000s. So on 4th June 1987, the Indian Air Force transport planes dropped 25 tons of relief materials consisting of rice, milk powder, vegetables and kerosene. The success of the air mission also halted Operation Vadamarachi. Rajiv Gandhi was hailed as a hero by the people of Tamil Nadu and took praise from all quarters of the political spectrum. But things were about to take a different turn. India's sudden military operation took Sri Lanka by surprise. Sri Lanka presumed that India would join hands with the LTT for a full-scale invasion of the island nation. Fearing this, the Sri Lankan President Jayavadane held talks with Rajiv Gandhi and on 29 July 1987 signed the Indo-Sri Lanka Peace Accord. According to this agreement, the Sri Lankan army would completely withdraw from the north and an Indian peacekeeping force would enter. All Tamil insurgent groups were to surrender their arms. After this, an autonomous elected Tamil government would be set up and all the rights of the Tamils would be restored. India assumed their mission would be easily accomplished as Sri Lanka had agreed to all the terms of the agreement and the LTT was a force that India had trained and nurtured. So within days of signing the treaty, the Indian army started to airlift soldiers and equipment to Sri Lanka. Within a month, an entire division of the Indian army arrived in Sri Lanka. It was only after its arrival in Sri Lanka did India find out that LTT was not willing to surrender arms. LTT leader Prabhagaran was determined to fight for a separate Tamil nation called Tamil Elam with or without India's help. This shocked India. At this point, the IPKF was ordered to forcefully disarm the LTT and capture Jaffna. With friends becoming foes, the Indian army launched Operation Pawan. The first operation in this mission was a Jaffna University helidrome. The aim of this operation was to capture the LTT leadership hiding inside Jaffna University building which served as a tactical headquarters of the LTT. Capturing the LTT leadership would make the LTT directionless and the rebels would quickly surrender. So on 12th October 1987, 120 commanders of the 10th Para and 360 soldiers of the 13th Sikh Light Infantry, that is a total of 418 soldiers, were to be airdropped into Jaffna University football ground using four MI-8 helicopters. Each MI-8 helicopter can carry 20 soldiers. Since the university football ground could accommodate only two MI-8s at a time, a total of 12 shuttles would be required to insert all soldiers needed for the operation. The paracommandos were headed by Major Shannon Singh. The Sikh ally was headed by Major Birender Singh. The commander of the whole operation was Major General Harkirat Singh. The whole operation was estimated to last just 90 minutes. As per the plan, the first group of paracommandos dropped would secure the location and mark the area for further insertion. But unknown to the Indian military, the LTD had broken into their communications and were fully ready for the assault. The Jaffna University campus was turned into a fortress. On the night of 11th October 1987, the first wave of two MI-8 helicopters took off from the Palali Air Base to Jaffna. Both helicopters switched off all their lights and hence the LTD did not spot them. At midnight, the two MI-8 helicopters landed in the Jaffna University football ground and all the 40 commandos landed unopposed. But before they could take defensive positions, they came under heavy fire from the Tamil Tigers, who by now encircled them. Due to this, the commandos were not able to mark the location for further landing of the MI-8 helicopters. During the ensuing battle, the second wave of two MI-8 helicopters arrived, but could not locate the drop zone as the commandos on the ground were busy fighting rebels. Because of this and the total darkness, 
The second wave helicopters abandoned their mission and returned to base. Meanwhile, the third shuttle of two Mi-8 helicopters headed to the university. But now, the LTD had tracked the route of the helicopter and directed heavy mission gun fire towards the incoming choppers. One para commando took a bullet shot and was wounded. The helicopters landed and all 40 commanders were offloaded, including the injured commander, who insisted on fighting with his fellow comrades. After a few more successful shuttles, the final tally of inserted soldiers were 120 para commandos and 30 Sikh ally against the intended 480 soldiers. No more insertion could be done as the LTT were beginning to use RPG rockets on the Mi-8 helicopters. As per the plan, the Sikh ally was to hold the landing ground and the para commandos will go off to the LTT leadership. Since the airdrop was not completed, the fate of the mission became unclear. Now the GOC 54 Division Commander, Major General Harikirat Singh, contacted Major Shannon and informed him about the situation and also instructed him to proceed with the mission. Major Shannon informed this to Major Birender Singh. He also advised him to dig in and hold on. The commandos then proceeded to locate the LTD leadership. They took the help of a local Tamil person, but in pitch darkness, they lost their way and got hold up in a nearby house. The paracommandos lost all communication with the Sikh ally as their radio man was shot dead soon after landing. All throughout the night, the soldiers of the Sikh ally bravely fought the LTT attack which was coming from all directions. They soon ran out of ammo and was getting killed one by one. By daybreak, the dark reality unfolded as almost all the 30 soldiers of the Sikh ally were killed. They ran out of ammunition and only one soldier named Sipoy Gora Singh was alive and was taken prisoner of war by the LTT. The next morning, with the paracommandos still holding out, a rescue force under Lieutenant Colonel Dalbir Singh was gathered and sent to rescue the trapped paracommandos. With three T-72 tanks and a small group of SF commandos, Dalbir Singh bravely headed to the battlefield. The LTT laid a minefield and a unit had to come up with an ingenious method to resume the mission. Lieutenant Colonel Dalvir Singh located and extricated the para commandos, but the Sikh light infantry was completely eliminated. The Indian Army lost 30 infantry men and 6 para commandos in the assault, and the whole operation lasted 18 hours. After this disastrous start, the Indian Army came to terms with the ground realities. Number one, the Indian Army had no training or knowledge of fighting guerrilla warfare, which the LTT was engaged in. Two, the LTT fighters perfectly blended with the local population and would suddenly attack the APKF. The Indian Army also for the first time had to face women and child soldiers. Any person about 10 years of age was a potential threat. Third, they had drastically underestimated the LTT who had superior communications and weapons compared to the Indian Army. The LTT also had a huge cache of hidden arms located all over northern Sri Lanka. Four, the intelligence provided was inadequate. And for the first few weeks, the Indian soldiers had no proper map of the area and were using tourist maps. Also, it was realized one division of soldiers and equipment was just not enough to fight the LTT. So the Indian Air Force now began another big airlift, bringing in more soldiers and weapons into Sri Lanka. Seven more divisions with a plenty of T-72 tanks and BMP-1 fighting vehicles were inducted. The Air Force also brought in the Mi-24 helicopter gunships and HAL Cheetah light helicopters. By end of October, the IF had flown 2,200 tactical transport and 800 helicopter sorties. Now reinforced, the IPKF resumed battle for Jaffna. New strategy to capture Jaffna was put into place. The LTT by now has mined all the approach road with Claymore mines and IEDs, which can be detonated remotely. The Indian Navy placed a 300 miles blockade over northern Sri Lanka in an effort to cut off the supply route of the LTT. For the next two weeks, the IPKF with the help of tanks, BMPs, Mi-24 gunships and using brute force, thrusted forward. The LTT used sophisticated sniper fire from hidden positions using telescopic lens heaped casualty after casualty on the IPKF. The Indian Navy's special forces, the Marcos, made their debut in this operation. The Marcos, under the cover of darkness, came in Gemini rafts and destroyed LTT speedboats in Gurunagar. They were detected and fired upon, but the Marcos commandos escaped unscathed. 
In spite of taking huge casualties, the IPKF finally wrested control of Jaffna city by the end of October. But the operations continued till the end of November. After taking over Jaffna, the Indian army also changed its tactics from conventional warfare to counterinsurgency, which means they will no longer be holding key strong points, but will fan out and conduct searches from street to street, house to house to flush out the rebels from their hideouts. Not able to keep up with the IPKF's brute force, the LTT leadership and its fighters slowly escaped to the jungles of Avunya. So to flush them out from there, the Indian Army launched Operation Trishul and Operation Virat in April 1988. This operation utilized approximately 15,000 troops, including the armored corps, the paratroopers, as well as the infantry and army aviation. The operation achieved success in disrupting LTT operation with the seizure of weaponry and inflicting casualties among the LTT cutters. Even though the Indian Army now took over most of the LTT controlled areas, the war was far from being over. All throughout 1988 and 1989, the IPKF conducted counterinsurgency operations in all theaters of war. But this operation brought in huge civilian casualties. As the months went by, the IPKF became deeply unpopular in Sri Lanka and also in native Tamil Nadu. In Tamil Nadu, the IPKF was viewed as an invading and oppressing force. The Sri Lankan government, now under a new president, Ranasinghe Premadasa, wanted the IPKF out. But the Rajiv Gandhi government was adamant and refused to pull out the IPKF. Premadasa then secretly ordered the Sri Lankan army to supply arms to the LTT to fight the IPKF. But in December 1989, Rajiv Gandhi lost the elections and was thrown out of power. VP Singh replaced him as a new Prime Minister of India. VP Singh did not think twice. He ordered the pullout of the IPKF. So the IPKF started their gradual pullout and by March 1990, the last battalion of the IPKF soldiers set sail for India. On addressing the assembly, the IPKF commander, Lieutenant General A.S. Kalkat said, We came as a proud force and we are leaving as a proud force. In spite of being in Sri Lanka for almost three years, the Indian Army failed to disarm the LTT and enforce the Indo-Sri Lankan Accord. A total of 1,165 personnel were killed. Because of such a high casualty rate and no outcome, this war is aptly nicknamed India's Vietnam. Back in India, the IPKF and its offensive in Sri Lanka is controversial. For the 1,165 Indian soldiers martyred, a memorial was built by the Sri Lankan government in 2008 in Colombo. Back in India, no memorial existed for a long time until the National War Memorial was constructed in 2019 in New Delhi. If you like this video, please subscribe for more. Thanks for watching.